stay a couple extra days. Um, and uh, after he had the uh, the more serious of the two procedures that he had to have, mom uh, opted to stay with him in the uh, hospital room. And I went back to the Comfort Inn where we had uh, secured the room. I went back there and uh, at that point I didn't have any idea how long we were going to have to stay uh, in Chapel Hill because it was all dependent upon how he responded uh, to things. So there in the hospital, uh, excuse me, there in the uh, motel room, uh, I sat beside the bed in a chair and I bowed my head and I said, Lord, you know that uh, I got to preach Sunday and uh, I don't have any idea when I'm going to get home. I don't have any idea how, you know, when I'm going to be able to study. I don't have any commentaries here. I don't have anything here but my Bible. And I prayed and I said, Lord, I, I just need some guidance. I need some direction. Uh, looked around and uh, didn't even have anything to write on. Uh, I had uh, meant to take a little notebook with me and had forgotten to do so. So I got to thumbing through my Bible and I had last week's bulletin in my Bible. And I sat there and I was uh, thinking and praying and God spoke to my heart. My message is on the back of this book for today. God gave me the whole thing in about 45 minutes. Normally it takes me several days of study and preparation. But God is good. God is good. So we're going to conclude this series today. And I want you to think with me for a moment on three words. The sermon title is, The Word Is... Dot, dot, dot. The Word... God's Word. The Word Is... And we'll look into that in just a moment, okay? You stand with me as we read from Psalm chapter 119, beginning with verse number 9. The verse begins by asking a question. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart, that is with my entire being, with everything that is within me, I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimony as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. In other words, give serious consideration to your way. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I'll let you be seated. Bow with me, please. Father, we praise you and thank you and bless you and bow in your presence. You are good and great and holy and righteous. And you are in control of all things. We come before you now and ask, Lord, that you speak by your Holy Spirit to our hearts. Lead us and guide us in these moments together. Make them profitable unto us. Challenge us. Convict our hearts. 
move us from where we are to where you would have us to be and lead us in a plain path and we'll thank you and praise you for it in the name of Christ our Savior we ask you Amen last week we talked about the importance of renewing the mind we were in Romans chapter 12 uh, most specifically the second verse we looked at uh, at verse 1 a couple of weeks ago we looked at verse 2 last week and we learned what uh, what was meant what the uh, Holy Spirit spoke through the Apostle Paul to our hearts concerning what it means to be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind so we talked about what it was and then we talked about how to accomplish it and I left you with the fact that the only way that you can have a renewed mind that the only way that you can continue to be refreshed and to stay where God wants you to be as far as he's concerned and not get pulled away by the things of the world and not be conformed to their image or into their likeness but to be in the image of Christ the only way that's possible is to stay in that book that you got on your lap we've got to stay in the word there is no other way there is no easier way there is no cheaper way it comes from staying in the Word. And we talked about that for a little bit last week. So with that in mind, I want to, like I said, continue and conclude this morning by calling your attention to three things. I said a moment ago, the message was called The Word Is. I want to give you three things concerning what the Word is. And I want you to write these three things down, and then I want you to write down the scriptures because you're going to need to go back and look at these a little bit later on. Okay? So like I told you before, if you take notes, write these things down. If you don't take notes, write these things down because it's that important. Okay? You need to also understand as we get started this morning, and I hope that you do, but in case you don't or in case you've never thought about it, the Word of God is a treasure chest. It contains great riches, glorious thoughts, powerful words. It gives direction and guidance. But it's not only a treasure chest, it is a toolbox. It contains things that we need to fix problems that we have. Okay? If you have a toolbox, you have things in that toolbox that hopefully will answer the problems or the questions or the dilemmas that come up in your life. Something goes on and you need a you need to tighten something up. According to what it is, you might need a screwdriver, you might need an adjustable wrench, you might need a socket and a ratchet, whatever the case is, but if you've got those in your toolbox, then you've got the answer to whatever the problem is when it crops up. The Word of God is a toolbox for the problems and the crises and the situations that come up in our life. Okay? So I say that to say this, three things concerning what the Word is. Number one, the Word is the answer concerning the worries that depress us. I'll give you a moment to write that down. The Word is the answer to the worries or concerning the worries that depress us. Now let me give you a scripture. Oh, and by the way, with every one of these three points, I'm going to give you two sub-points. It's football season. High school's already been going for a couple of weeks. College got started this past week. Uh, 
the uh, professionals get started a week from today, so it's football season. So, so this will be a, a good way and an easy way to remember. The two sub points that I'm going to give you, one will be offensive and one will be defensive. Okay? One will be something that could move you forward and one could be something that would help you to stand. Okay? So think about those and I'll share, you, share those with you as we get to them. Okay, but number one, the word is the answer concerning the worries that depress us. The first scripture that I want to share with you this morning is from Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. And we will call this, this is the offensive, okay? And I'll give you a word that this talks about. Just the simple word, peace. The Word of God provides peace. Okay? Look at what the Word of God says beginning chapter 4 and verse 6. Paul writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through or by Christ Jesus. What a wonderful testimony. What a powerful promise we've been given there concerning peace. Paul said, be anxious for nothing. We've talked about this before. Basically, anxious is a synonym here for worry. So Paul is saying, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Don't worry about it, pray about it. Don't try to handle it yourself, let him handle it. Don't lay it at your feet, lay it at his feet. He's there for you, so let him help you. You know what our situation is, and I think I've said this to you before. Paul says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And, and basically what we end up doing is, we worry about everything, and we pray about very little of anything. We take what he says here and flip it completely over, and do almost the, uh, the, the opposite of what he talks about here. We worry about everything and pray about nothing. Or pray about very little. We worry ourselves to death. Do, do you know that a recent study was done through Christianity Today magazine that says... I want, you to, I want you to get this. This is important. It says that 80% of the things that we worry about never happen in our life. Isn't that profile? 80% of the things that you worry about will never take place. So you know what you're doing? Wasting time. Wasting time, wasting energy, turning yourself inside out, being all lit up in a, in a fix for things that 80% of the time aren't even going to happen. <coughs> that ever happened to you? You worried about something, 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 and it never took place. And it's like, boy, what that always is done. Paul says, don't worry about it, pray about it. Sometimes people say, oh, I can't sleep. And, and I've heard people say, you know, well, when you can't sleep, count sheep. That's useless. You know, five million three hundred eighteen thousand one, five million three hundred eighteen thousand. But 
when you can't sleep, don't count sheep. Talk to the shepherd. Okay? Talk to the shepherd. Talk to the one who made the sheep. He can handle it. Count the sheep won't do anything but give your brain disease. You know, because you count it so much. Don't worry about it. Pray about it. The Word of God is the answer concerning the worries that depress us. Paul said, don't worry, pray. Then I came on a, a, a scripture the other day. I know I've read it before. I'm sure you've read it before. But this thing, when I read it, hit me directly between the eyes. And I thought, boy, right there it is. We talk about this thing of not worrying, but, but focusing on Him. And in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, we find these words. Listen. You will keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. That's the defense. Okay? The offensive was peace that was talked about here. The defensive is purpose from Isaiah chapter 26. God will give you not only peace, but will give you purpose. Don't worry about it. Pray about it. Because if you do, what happens? God will keep you in perfect peace. You know what that means? Absolute peace. God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You know what that means? To be fastened. To be fastened. To be fixed. To be held by. Okay? Let's just say, for instance, church bought some sort of picture and we we're going to hang it up this morning. We dedicated it, we're going to hang it up. And we're going to hang it right there under that line. So I bring it over here and I say, you know, we've dedicated this picture to the glory of God and now we're going to put it up here where it needs to go and I just stick it up against the wall and I turn around and walk off from it. What's going to happen? Is it going to stay there? No. Why? Because it's not fastened to that wall. It's not secured to the wall. So the only way that we can make sure that it stays is to put a nail or to put some sort of a, a, a hanger there that we can actually put the picture on so that it will hold it in place. Therefore, the picture now is what? Fixed, fastened, secured. That's what Isaiah is talking about. You will keep the man in perfect peace whose mind, whose heart is nailed to you. Whose mind and whose heart are fixed upon you. Friend, we can't be all over the place as far as the world is concerned and then expect to be in perfect and absolute peace. Okay? We've got to be focused and fastened and fixed upon him. So first of all, the word of God is the answer concerning the worries that depress us. Let me give you one other verse of scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes these words to his younger brother in the Lord. Verse number 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you worry about things, guess what? God didn't give you that. Okay? That spirit of worry, that spirit of fear, that didn't come from God. Okay? That didn't come from God. 
Paul tells Timothy and he tells us, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power and love and a sound, secured, steadfast mind. So number one, the Word of God is the answer concerning the worries that depress us. Number two, the Word of God is the answer concerning the weapons that defend us. The Word of God is the answer concerning the weapons that defend us. Again, two verses of Scripture, or two passages of Scripture. The first one deals with the offensive. And the word would be prevail. Okay? The word of God helps us to prevail. And the scripture is one that you know. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The Bible says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God discerns between the thoughts and the intents of our heart. God will give us direction if we will stay in His Word and allow him to guide our staff. Isn't that what Proverbs chapter 3 says? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your life. Sure. So this is just a reiteration of what's said over in Proverbs. But I want you to notice something. The Word of God is a living, powerful Sword sharper than any two-edged sword. I want you to think with me a minute. I don't know whether you've ever considered this or not. Think of a regular sword for a moment. Okay? Civil War, whatever the case is, a sword. What is a sword used for in battle? Anybody? Kill. Kill. To kill people. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Here's what I want you to remember. A sword, you need to get this, this is good. A sword pierces a living man and puts him to death. Okay? A sword pierces a living man to put him to death. The word of God pierces a dead man and brings him to life. Isn't that good? A sword pierces a living man to put him to death. But the word of God pierces a dead man and brings him to life. Make me have to sit out here and start again and say, okay? Sharper than any two-edged sword. A sword with with a double edge. Now some of them only had a single edge. But a sword with a double edge was what? It caused problems going in and coming out. Okay. A lot of times, what a soldier would do is when they when they went when they thrust forward, they would thrust one way, and when they pull it out, they would twist their wrist and pull out the other. That way, you got it from both sides. That's what Paul talks about here concerning the Word of God. But the but the Word of God does not do it to harm us. 
The Word of God does it to help us and to heal us and to teach us. So it helps. It helps us prevail. But secondly, it helps to protect us. It helps to protect us concerning the weapons that defend us. It's the answer concerning the weapons that defend us in, in Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning with verse 10, we find these words. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole, the entire armor of God. You might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand or to remain standing. In other words, take it on, on yourself that in that day, after everything is said and done, you are still standing. You have not succumbed. You have been victorious through Jesus Christ. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God remember what we just read from Hebrews 4.12 take the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints now Paul told us not only to put on the whole armor of God, but then Paul basically listed what that armor was. Did you pay any attention to what the, the common theme or, or the, the common thread that ran through every one of those pieces of armor or those pieces of equipment? Gird your waist with truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. With the exception of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, all other pieces of armor, every single one of these, the, the common thread that, that runs through here is Every piece of this armor protected the front of the body. You know why? Because when you go out to warfare, you march forward, not back. Okay? If you're running away from warfare, then you retreat. But when you're going forward, you march forward. So it is to protect you as you are going forward into battle for the cause of Christ. Okay? It will protect us. Everything here, everything here, as far as these pieces of weaponry are concerned, or not weaponry, armor are concerned, are to defend us. That's the defense. They are to defend us, to protect us. Every one of these will protect us with the exception of one. And that one is what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You don't go out into battle with all of this armament on and leave that thing sheathed in here and walk out there because what happens? You'll get defeated. So you put on all of this armor and then you unsheath that sword and you go forward with that thing guiding you. And not only helping protect you 
participating in the Word of God. The Word of God is the answer concerning the weapons that defend us. Third, the Word of God is the answer concerning the warfare that defeats us. The Word of God is the answer concerning the warfare that defeats us, or I guess I should say that threatens to defeat us. That threatens to defeat us. The offensive here is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The Word of God gives power. That's our word, power. Listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 3. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Okay? In other words, even though you and I are human, even though we walk in this body that we have here, our warfare is not with flesh and blood. Our warfare is with the enemy. And the enemy is not you and me. The enemy is Satan. Okay? So Paul tells us here, for, even, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not human, they're not fleshly, but mighty in God. Listen, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul says here that there is power in the Word of God to help us concerning the warfare that would seek to destroy us or to defeat us because the Word of God will give us the opportunity and will give us the power and the provision to pull down strongholds to cast down arguments and every other thing that stands as a threat or exalts itself above the knowledge of God and brings every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know what a stronghold is? Think of a fortress. Okay? Or think of a military force. Something that is strong, and something that is well fortified and protected. Now follow. Satan attempts to establish a beachhead in every one of our lives. He, he attempts, he desires, he works toward establishing a footing in our lives from which, if that's not taken care of, the footing and the beachhead, he will continue to build and continue to build until the beachhead becomes a strong hole. Okay? He gets his foot in the door and if he's not ushered out, he just continues to take more and more and more and more of our lives. <clears throat> so finally, he establishes a stronghold, a fortification, a fortress in our lives from which he tries and attempts to operate and control our lives. You understand what I'm saying? Now listen to me very carefully. Satan 
is a master strategist and tactician. Okay? I know those are war terms, but I think everybody in here can identify with them. Satan is a master strategist and tactician. I'm not talking about Satan, but just to give you an example. Back here in the Civil War, one of the greatest, if probably, if not the greatest, military strategist and tactician in that day was the commanding general of the Confederate forces, a man by the name of Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee had an uncanny ability to be able to know where the enemy was weak and would attack in the place of the enemy's weakness. Now, doesn't that make sense? Yeah. For instance, if you are the commanding general and there are two forces, yours and theirs, and you find out that they are basically laid out in three fronts, let's say, here in front, off to the left, off to the right. And let's say here in front, they've got 50,000 troops. Here off to the left, they've got 10,000. Here off to the right, they've got 10,000. Does it make any sense to invade the front where there's 50,000? No. So what would you do? Go around to attack one of the flanks, either the left or the right. That's what Robert E. Lee was a master of being able to do. Sometimes would take his army and would leave a portion of his army here to give the, the idea or the impression that here's where we're going to attack and take the main body of his army and loop around to the other side and attack from the rear. While they're waiting for the enemy to come from this direction, they suddenly hear and find out that the enemy is there. Satan is brilliant and doing the same. Hear me very carefully. Everybody in here needs to understand. He knows where you are strong. And he knows where you are weak. He knows where he knows the areas of your life that are secured like Fort Knox. And then he knows the areas of your life that basically have one strand of fence. Now, where do you think he's going to attack? Here at the front of Fort Knox? No. No. He knows where you're weak. And that's where he comes. Every single time. I'm reminded of the great football coach from the past, Vince Lombardi, who coached the Green Bay Packers to the first two Super Bowl victories. And Vince Lombardi, while he was a great coach and a great motivator, did not have a lot of plays in his playbook. Okay? He had a sweep right, a sweep left, and several other passes, and this, that, and the other. But one of the things that they would do is that... Now, I don't want to get too technical here for fear I'm going to lose some of you folks. Uh, but on the, on the line of scrimmage at the front where the, the, the ball is, is uh, uh, located, uh, on the offensive side, if the, if the sweep was going to go to the left, let's say, the right guard would pull. In other words, rather than him going forward to take on his blocker, on this particular play, when the ball was snapped, he'd come up out of his position and would go this way to take out a linebacker or a defensive end on this side. Okay? So they would try to run it to the point of where he had more men over here than the defense had over here. They called it running to daylight. Okay? And somebody asked Vince Lombardi one time, why don't you have any more plays in your playbook than what you got? And he said, and I thought this was brilliant, when they learn how to defend against the ones that we got, then we'll put some more in. They haven't learned how to stop this. And they never did. 
They never did. But he said, once they learn how to defend against that, then I'll come up with something else. But until they get this right, we're going to keep doing the same old thing. Listen, Satan does the same thing over and over and over until you allow God to get it right. You don't have to come up with 15 million different strategies. He knows where you're weak. That's where he's going to get you. Every single time. Every single time. Well, let me conclude. I've given you the, the fact, the offensive, that the, that the Word of God gives power. But let me also give you the defensive. The Word of God will also give you provision. Concerning being the answer concerning the warfare that would seek to defeat us. It will give you not only power, but provision. Listen for just a minute from Matthew chapter 4. This is very enlightening. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him upon the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest, your foot, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up upon an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said unto him, All these things I will give unto you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. Behold, the angels came and ministered. Three times Satan attacked Jesus in the wilderness that we are told about. And with every single occurrence, Jesus comes back at him what? With the Word of God. Jesus not only gives him the Scripture, but says, as it is written. And three times from the book of Deuteronomy, he comes back at Satan until finally he tells Satan, be gone. Just go. Now, won't you understand something? When Jesus told him to go, he went. He didn't say, well, who do you think you are, big boy? You're not going to tell me what to do. I'll stay here as long as I want to. And I'll do whatever I want to. And you can't stop me. So just shut your mouth. That's not what he said. You know why? Because he knew. Listen to me. I proved he knew he was no match for the Savior. He knew I can only go this far and no farther. He knew he was limited in his attack. And he knew that when Jesus said, Be gone, that it was in his best interest to leave. The same one who had provision in the wilderness is the same one that will give you provision. But he comes knocking on your door and attacks you at your point. But you must know this book. It is absolutely crucial.
Okay. Now, do you need to know it all? All 66 books? Well, of course not. Nobody, nobody has uh, memorized all the 66 books. But you need to have some of this in here. So that when the, the attack comes, you know how to respond appropriately. And you also need to be so familiar with this that when you are in need of help, you know where to go to find the help that you need. You don't want to open this book and look at it and it look like Chinese because you've not spent any more time in it and it's like, I don't even know where to start. Listen, you need to get into this book and you need to allow the Holy Spirit of God to get this book to you. That's the only way you're going to be victorious. That's the only way you're going to have a renewed mind. That's the only way that you're going to be able to escape the stinking thinking and be able to be victorious in this world in which we live. Friend, listen to me. It's only going to get worse. Okay? As the time draws closer and closer to hand for the Lord Jesus Christ to take His church out of here in the rapture, Satan just going to keep turning up to Okay? Because he knows his days are numbered. He's going to do everything he can. He'll throw everything at you and the kids. But here's your protection. Here's your defense. Here's your weapon. Here's your answer. It's not out there. It's not even in here. It's here. Don't let this book go to waste. He gave it to you. Make sure that we get into it and allow it to get into it. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, you know our hearts. You know where we are. You know whether or not we are strong or weak. You know whether or not we are succeeding or failing in this area of your word. You know whether or not it is precious to us or almost foreign to us. You know how much time we spend with you and your word or how little time we spend. Please help us to understand and, and, and realize today that the only way we're going to be victorious is to stand upon the Word and to stand with He who gave us this Word, who breathed this Word into existence. We cannot, we will not make it on our own. We are not strong enough to take all the wiles of the enemy by ourselves. Just like we read a moment ago and talked about from Matthew chapter 4, Satan is not strong enough to stand against Christ. <coughs> he is our refuge, our strength. Help us to hide your word in our heart. Not only that we might not sin against you, but Lord, that it might be there so that the next time we need that word, will know where to go. Lord, have your will away in this time of decision and invitation. Speak as only you can and help us, Lord, to be responsive to your name. For we pray these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Our hymn is 329. God has spoken to your heart. You need to come. This altar is open. If I can help you pray about something, I'll be more than happy to do so.
grace that is greater than our sin. Let's stand again. Allow God to speak.